Live from Notre Dame Stadium and the WNDU Studios, this is 16 News Now's Countdown to Kickoff. It's a crisp mid-fall afternoon in the shadow of the Golden Dome as the breeze sends some of the colorful leaves flying. There is football in the air as the Irish get set to defend their home turf for the second straight Saturday. And folks, come on in because you are looking live inside Notre Dame Stadium. Number four, Notre Dame puts its unblemished record on the line here today against the underdog Louisville Cardinals who come to the bend for their second visit ever. Good afternoon and welcome into 16 News Now's Countdown to Kickoff. I'm Mark School Jr. And I'm WHME Sports Director Chuck Freeby. We start with the speedy Irish offense. Three games into this young season, Mark, they are off and running. After a fumble on the second play from scrimmage for the Irish against Florida State, the Domers quickly kicked it in the gear. Notre Dame scored touchdowns on its next two possessions and put the foot on the gas, scoring 42 points on the night. The Irish went off for 353 rushing yards, 554 yards of total offense, and averaged 8.3 yards per play. They are just pleased with their powerful offensive performance against the Seminoles. They left that game as a really confident bunch. I don't ever shy away from contact. I embrace contact. So then I'm, um, when I'm running the ball, if I have to, and I have to run somebody over, then I'll do that. But if I have to make a miss, I'll do that as well. We got a lot of guys who can play, and we're going to get all of them in, and we're going to do it you know, in certain ways. That's the best part about Coach Reese's offense. So uh, I thought they did an unbelievable job tonight. It, it was nice, kind of like 24-hour rule. It was kind of nice having that game and running the ball well, but I mean, we've got to move on and look forward. They are moving forward, but this powerful offense accomplished something that hasn't been done by a Notre Dame team in 20 years. The Irish scored 42 points in consecutive ball games. Now, part of what has made this offense so powerful are some emerging new faces that are already making their mark on the Irish. Kyron Williams at least had a little seasoning last year. But Chris Tyree is on his way to being an impact player as a freshman. He's just shy of the pace to break Josh Adams' school record for freshman rushing yards. Freshman tight end Michael Mayer, second on the team in receptions with six grabs, including his first career touchdown. Freshman corner Clarence Lewis is back in the lineup today. He leads the team with three pass breakups. And linebacker Jack Kaiser of Pioneer High School made his First mark in his first career start against South Florida. Brian Kelly certainly appreciates the contribution from his young guns, but worries they may have raised the expectations of fans and themselves to unreasonable levels. These freshmen will continue to get better, but uh, I don't want them to be um, factored in, you know, to the level where they have to be impactful. We have a number of veteran players that are really um, – find players that are looking to get into, you know, kind of a, a, a continuous kind of continuity on a day-to-day -day basis that they haven't had, right? Because we've been, you know, starting and stopping. And I look for them to have um, big improvement in, in this next week. Now, we didn't even include all the freshmen that Kelly mentioned, but he's right, Mark. The veterans on this team have to step up. And that's especially true on the defensive side of the ball. Megan Smedley joins us from the studio. And, Megan, it wasn't pretty for Clark Lee's group last week. Yeah, guys, just because the Irish got a 16-point win doesn't mean everything went perfectly. And Brian Kelly wasn't afraid to say that. Kelly says the Irish defense did not have their A game last week against Florida State. He says the blue and gold gave away 10 points from missed tackles and poor coverage. Now, to be fair, a handful of defenders did not get a full week of practice in as they returned from isolation or quarantine, but that's not an excuse in Kelly's eyes. I think there were some uncharacteristic um defensive lapses, if you will, that uh, occurred that uh, we don't normally see, but we will address those and our guys are aware of them and uh, they'll be corrected uh, for this weekend. There's been some bumps and there's been some highs. There's been some lows and highs. So, um, you know, one game we may be good, another game we may, um, you know, have some things to correct. And that's the process of, you know, being a, a defense, being, you know, people in ourselves, you know, being imperfect. 
Kelly says it's not the kind of defense Clark Lee wants to put out there, and it's certainly not the defense he wants to put out there either. And now with everyone back, expect to see the Notre Dame defense fans have come to expect. And Mark and Chuck, as the number four team in the country, Irish fans are expecting a lot from them. You've got that right, Meg and Chuck. We've hit the quarter pull of this wacky season. The questions are still valid. What's great? What's good? And what's not so good about the Irish? Well, what's great is the solid running game of Notre Dame. They have one of the best offensive lines in the nation. And this dynamic duo of Williams and Tyree, very, very explosive coming out of the backfield. What's good for the Irish? I would say the passing game because it's developing. Ian Book had his best game of the season last week against Florida State. And the Irish receivers, especially Javon McKinley, starting to come around. What's not so good? The defensive front six is a question. Uh, Florida State gashed that defense at times last week for some big plays. They have not had the kind of productivity, especially from the linebackers, that they need to have to beat good teams. For me, what's been great has been offensive coordinator Tommy Reese. He's in his first season as the offensive coordinator, and it seems to me he's pushing all the right buttons. We're going to throw out the first half of the Duke game, by the way, but he's been doing really well. I like how he's committed to running the football. As for what's good for me, it's been Ian Book as a passer. Listen, I know he's gotten a lot of uh, tough love from Irish fans, but he, he's not going to win the Heisman, but he's going to win some football games, and he complete, uh, completed some pretty passes last week. The not so good, Notre Dame special teams. Lawrence Keyes muffed the punt last week, and then two domers collided on another punt return. Plus, on top of that all, Jonathan Dorr also missed a field goal. If you're a top five team in the country, you can't be making mistakes on special teams. But I do expect uh, Brian Pulling to clean all that up. Here's the problem with what's good in there. If Ian Book is just good come November with Clemson, Boston College, North Carolina, I'm not sure that's good enough. But that leads us to today's Lock Monday Auto Group Irish fan poll at WNDU.com. <laughs> with Notre Dame currently number four, we want to know, will they still be in the top four at the end of the season and make the college football playoff? But right now, 56% of you say yes, they are playoff bound. 44% say no, you're not buying in. There is still plenty of time to vote in the Lock Monday Auto Group Irish fan poll on WNU.com. Well, the final results around 220. Now to Irish injuries, and this one is very disappointing for local fans. The favorite, Paul Moala, out of Penn High School, is out for the rest of the season. The Penn High School grad tore his Achilles during the second quarter last week and needed surgery to repair it. The junior linebacker had seven tackles so far this year before his season came to a halt. Despite the major setback, he's keeping his head held high. Moala tweeted, if this injury taught me anything, it's that no matter who you are, there are people that care for you. So grateful for the kind messages. Never cried so much in my life, knowing my season was done. But I fully trust God has a plan for me. All love and mad love to my boys. 13 out. And we, of course, can't wait to see number 13 back on the field in 2021. I know I definitely am. Now, right now, only one regular Irish player joins Mawala on the inactive list this week. Wide receiver Lawrence Keys III is out with the concussion. A big dif difference from just a few weeks ago. Now, one man who is in it, remains active, is Liam Eichenberg. He amazingly got back on the field last week after getting a massive shiner. He tells us what he had to do to make it happen around 2.15. And up next, we catch up with an Irish icon. The Notre Dame basketball season just started without Muffet McGraw at practice for the first time in more than three decades. But as you'll see, she's far from kicking up her feet and easing into retirement. And with the Irish finally headed on the road next week, here is your first trivia test. In the last 100 years, when is the latest Notre Dame took its first road trip of the season? The answer when the countdown returns in two minutes. Here is your Countdown to Kickoff trivia answer. Since 1920, the latest Notre Dame took its first road trip of the season was on November 3rd, 1934. And there were some similarities to this season. The opponent that day was the Pitt Panthers, just like next week's first road foe for the 2020 team. Also, first year coach and four horsemen, Elmer Layden's Irish played four home games before that first road test, just like this year. Now there is one thing this year's team sure hopes not to repeat. Pitt won that day 19 to zip. 
Glad we could dip into my personal archives for that video. Uh, some other schedule quirks here, Mr. Skull. The first goes back more than a century. Do you know the latest date ever that a Notre Dame team took its first road trip of the season? That would be January 1st of 1894. It actually ended the 1893 season. Notre Dame lost to the University of Chicago 8-0 that day. And, Chuck, you even have to go back 80 years to find the last time Notre Dame hit the road for the first time later than they will this season. The first road game in 1940 was on October 26, two days later than this season. Elmer Layden's team shut out Illinois 26 to nothing that day during his last season on the Irish sideline. Now to another Irish legend who just completed her own last season on the Irish sidelines. If you've watched the countdown for the last, say, quarter century, you know one of our favorite recurring live guests is Muffet McGraw. And we couldn't let a season go by without checking in virtually with the recently retired Irish women's hoops coach. Coach, you've been retired for a few months now. How's the retired life treating you? Well, I'm a lot busier than I thought I would be and certainly spending a lot more time at home than I thought I would be, uh, but I'm really enjoying teaching. That has been something that has really, it's taken a lot of time, it's a lot of work, and I love it. Muffet, we've seen some clips of the team practicing on social media as we record this. This is their first official day of practice. How much do you miss coaching? You know, I, uh, I really feel like I'm in a good place right now, and I'm excited to be a fan of this team and certainly a fan of Neil Ivey's. Um, but I think eventually I'm, I'm definitely going to miss it as it goes on. I did love practice. That was my favorite part of the day. Now, Coach, when you look back at your Notre Dame career, you've been here for 33 years. What do you cherish the most? You know, I think the relationships, uh, all those so many amazing women that I got to coach and, and still can keep in touch with. And, and I love when those former players then become friends and um, I can be, still be a part of their lives. And I'm going to miss the fans, um, but certainly the players and, and just that camaraderie uh, with the staff. You know, we had such a great staff and such a fun group. Need to congratulate you. You were just named one of Sports Illustrated's 100 Most Influential Women in Sports. And obviously a coach always or should have influence within their team. But when did you feel comfortable or confident about speaking out on larger matters? Well, I, you know, I think when Pat Summit went into, um, had her illness and then eventually passed away, I think there was just a huge void in the women's game. And I think that it, I looked around and I thought, somebody's got to pick up the slack there and, and who's it going to be? And then he kind of looked in the mirror and went like, why not me? You know, why don't I start speaking up? Because I definitely have some passion for women in coaching and for our game to move forward and for how we can do better. And I'm, I'm really excited to be involved in that and to continue to push for that. Coach, you mentioned earlier that you're excited to watch Neil Ivey lead this team. What advice have you given to her and how do you hope that she can continue the success of this Notre Dame women's basketball program? Well, I have so much confidence in Neil and what she's going to do. She has waited for this moment and she has earned it and she is ready for it. So I'm excited to be the biggest cheerleader for her. And we'll talk occasionally about some things. She can run things by me and I can give her some feedback, whether she takes it or not. I'm going to be here for her. Um, but I think the biggest advice, first of all, don't read your notifications on Twitter. <laughs> that's, that's number one. Uh, don't worry about what people are saying and what people are thinking. Just concentrate on the group that you have. How long did it take you to learn that lesson about social media? Oh, I, I that was immediate. I never got on there. And people, people were like, wow, did you see what people were saying? And I said, no, actually, and I don't want to know. So if I wanted to know, I'd find out, but I don't. Now you just heard Muffet briefly mention teaching. So what is it like in Professor McGraw's classroom? She tells us when we pick up the conversation in about 20 minutes. We'll also hear about her team effort to collect food for the needy. And don't worry, we'll get a question in about her eventual statue on campus too. Up next on the countdown, it's the Irish Illustrated Report. The Twin Tims join us to talk about just how good Notre Dame is. We'll also get their take on the job Tommy Reese is doing and Ian Book's performance so far when the countdown rolls back in two minutes. Back inside Notre Dame Stadium for, believe it or not, already the fourth time in 2020. Today, it's the Louisville Cardinals who've come to visit, hoping to repeat history and get a win just like they did the only other time they were here in 2014. 
course, this 2020 Irish team is a lot better than that 2014 version that was already in the middle of a free fall when the cards came to town. But are this year's Irish truly one of the top teams in the country? That's where we start this week's Irish Illustrated Report. Tim Priester through three games this season. The Irish haven't played the best competition, but they're 3-0, and and now they're the number fourth-ranked team in the country. Just so how good is this Notre Dame team? I think they're deserving of the number four ranking. Uh, I think that's legitimate un under the circumstances. I realize it's a, an unusual year, but I think that they've earned that. Their offensive line is legit. We'll have a better idea of that when they go to Pittsburgh. And then, of course, Clemson a couple of weeks later. And defensively, uh, you know, the struggle last week, I think there are some circumstances, some issues there that uh, explain that away. But, I, you know, I think they're a legitimate top five team. I think that they've proven that. We're going to see uh, how their defense handles a real dynamic offense against Louisville and then how their offensive line handles a great defensive line at Pittsburgh. So we have some tests coming up, but I think they're legit at this point. Well, Mally, one of the biggest storylines coming into the season was Tommy Reese getting the offensive coordinator gig through three games. How do you think he's doing? Well, through the last two and a half games, he's been outstanding. It was, you know, you looked, I just broke down the run efficiency for lack of a better word is, do you get the yards you're supposed to get on first, second, and third down? And they were terrible in game one, 35%. Then they've been otherworldly, 72% and almost 77%. Those numbers, I mean, they might continue this week. They can't continue all year because it's out of this planet. But the way he has found his identity with offensive line, two tight ends, and a physical running game, even physical blocking wide receivers, I, he gets an A from me at this point. TP, I thought Ian Book looked better last week after two bumpy performances to start the year. Is that the Ian Book we should expect to see the rest of the year? I think we all certainly hope so. <laughs> you know, this will be his 27th start coming up. And and uh, the thing I loved about last week, I agree. I mean, that was – he was extremely decisive. He trusted his eyes. He trusted what he saw, and he went for it. And, and I think when you're making your – 27 start this week I think that's what a fan base should expect of a quarterback um, it should be fairly easy picking is against Louisville this week but you just want him to take charge he ran when he you know they haven't run the football with him as much but when he saw it he went for it he got down on the ground before there was contact now Tim O'Malley one of Ian Book's big targets last week against Florida State was Javon McKinley and Brian Kelly says no one in the country can defend this guy. Can he be as good as Kelly builds him up to be? I think it's the power of positive thinking. It's great coaching by Brian Kelly. Uh, they need Javon McKinley to be a part-time or a weapon in the passing game because he has to be on the field. He's too good at blocking. As I mentioned, this offense runs the ball, and Javon McKinley opens lanes downfield. You know the offensive line is going to open some holes. It is a, it's a huge difference. If Javon McKinley's not hitting these blocks for Kyron Williams and Chris Tyree, they are getting untouched touchdown runs because the receivers and the tight ends block. If he's going to go out there and catch four balls on six targets and block the way he does, that's going to help this offense as they get more wide receivers involved in, in Lindsey and we assume at some point Kevin Austin. Tim and Tim talk Irish defense and what to expect from Louisville when we pick things up in the Irish Illustrated Report in just under a half hour. And you can subscribe to Irish Illustrated. It is the number one source for Notre Dame Sports Online. Just head to irishillustrated.com, click on join, and find the best plan for you. And up next, dealing with all of the demands of a season while also handling the stress we all feel right now during the pandemic. We look at how the Irish are keeping sharp and hear from their mental performance coach when the countdown comes back back in two minutes. Back on the countdown, the University of Notre Dame announced earlier this week it is limiting student activities to just 10 people or less to try to stem a recent surge of coronavirus cases here on campus. Now, it's important to point out that this won't affect today's crowd since students are assigned to sit with roommates and groups of four or less. Still, it's just the latest reminder of how different this year is and how much the men in the gold helmets have to navigate just to play. And that's where we bring in the countdown's Lindsay Stone, who joins us on campus. Lindsay, there are many obstacles this season. Chuck, we know the pandemic has affected all of us and it's taken a mental toll. College football players are no exception. Their daily lives have been turned upside down between new guidelines in place and isolation. So how does that impact their performance on the field? Hear from the players and the woman being credited with helping them get through the roller coaster of 2020. 
From 80,000 cheering fans to just 10,000. From high fives to isolated team meals, it's no secret things are very different this season. And the term face mask means something new. I can't do anything about this virus. Well, my mindset is, you know, what can I control? Um, what can I um, do to put myself in the be best position um, for the team and for my future? Um, you know, to, to win the national championship. With so much uncertainty surrounding the college football season, players are doing their best to stay focused on what they can control. I would say mostly just being, you know, being one team, you know, being collective as a team and a mindset of what we want to accomplish this season. I'm, I'm coming to the Goog every day with a mindset to get better um, and controlling what I can control. The brain is not a muscle in the scientific sense, but it functions like a muscle in the extent that the parts of it that we use grow and get stronger. And so, you know, for the last three years, we've been saying, hey, folk, be in the present, right? Right here, right now. Dr. Amber Selking is a mental performance coach for the Notre Dame football team. For us, you know, as it relates to performance, there's something uh, known as like stockpiling resilience. And what you do ahead of difficult situations really prepares you for how you navigate when those difficult situations arise. Over the last several years, We've done a great job of, of laying a great foundation and a strong culture. Like many of us, the players have been staying connected with loved ones over Zoom calls and are taking it one day at a time. If you look at this as the potential last day, right, then that can create fear or that can create gratitude. And, and those are very different physiological reactions in our body. Those are very different mental reactions in our mind. Um, and, and the pandemic, if anything, has given us a great opportunity for our young men to really understand what that means when we say, hey, one day at a time. Every day, uh, choosing, you know, making that choice to, to, to treat it as if it's your last, because, you know, with this COVID situation, you never know what comes next. So I think that it gave guys the extra hunger, extra boost to, to give it everything that you had uh, with nothing being set in stone. As cases continue to surge here on campus and around St. Joe County, the players say they are grateful for any chance they get to set foot on the turf. And really that old cliche rings with new meaning this year. The players say they're taking it one day at a time. Mark and Chuck, I'll send it back to you in the stadium. Aren't we all? Thank you very much, Lindsay. Up next, what did the Irish think of the Cardinals and what does Louisville think of Notre Dame? Quick hit starts with each of their scouting reports when the countdown returns in two minutes. Live from Notre Dame Stadium and the WNDU Studios, this is 16 News Now's Countdown to Kickoff. The Louisville Cardinals have flown north to the house that Rockneyville, and these birds hope to sink their teeth into a South Bend stunner. Of course, the number four Irish want none of that upset talk. They plan to protect their now 21-game home winning streak. Back inside the countdown with WHMB Sports Director Chuck Freeby, I'm Mark Skull Jr. As we get ready for quick hits here on the countdown, Megan and Lindsay have rejoined us. They'll chime in in just a moment. But first, let's look at the last time the Irish and Louisville met on the gridiron. That was last year's season opener down in the Commonwealth. The Irish came out, had all kinds of problems defensively in the first quarter, couldn't stop the cards on two touchdown drives. Finally, Clark Lee's group settled down, and the Irish dominated the last three quarters on the way to a 35-17 win. Tony Jones Jr. ran for 117 yards. Jameer Smith found the end zone twice, and the Irish exploited three cardinal fumbles. Of course, Many of Notre Dame's players remember that contest, but they also have seen a new look to the Cardinals this year with Malik Cunningham taking the reins at quarterback. Javian Hawkins is back at running back. He racked up 127 yards against the Irish last year. But the man who may be perceived as the biggest threat is receiver Tutu Atwell. He had five grabs against the Irish last year and certainly remains on the minds of the Notre Dame defense. It's hard to cover speed and you can't teach it. So um, we have the game plan around it. I feel like we will. Coach Lee, Coach Joseph will set up a good game plan for that. But yeah, I mean, when it comes to him, he's just a game breaker. Every time he gets the ball in his hands, he can go the distance. So I feel like we have going back to it. We have to be great with our eyes, know where he's at at all times, and um, try to figure out how to stop him. Coach Lee always, always, always tells us, um, you know, the duty as a competitor is to respect all your opponents. And that's what we try to do. Uh, we'll make a few adjustments. We'll make a few tweaks, you know, um, you know, covering the perimeter and making sure uh, that we contain the pocket. But um, even in that sense, we want to treat everybody, um, you know, as they are the best. 
Of course, it's only natural to wonder what the other side is saying. So, Megan, what's the card regard for the Irish? Chuck, the Cardinals didn't look too hot last week against Georgia Tech, and heading into today's game, Louisville is focused on themselves. Head coach Scott Satterfield says for him, the focus of the game isn't on Notre Dame, but on his own team. He says if the Cardinals worry about themselves and fixing their mistakes, they'll have a good game today. But of course, he has to scout his opponent. Satterfield is impressed with the Fighting Irish across the board, but one thing jumps out. I think the number one thing that stands out about Notre Dame is their offensive line, arguably the best offensive line in the country. I, I think, you know, with the guys that have played a lot of ball together up front, you know, guys, these is Notre Dame. They, they recruit the best players in the country year in and year out. Um, they have depth. Uh, they, they have, you know, it's just an outstanding program. I mean, we, 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 you know, so there's really, as you look at them, you know, there's not a ton of weaknesses on this football team. Satterfield also says having a veteran quarterback in Ian Book has been huge for Notre Dame. Now, Mark, as we've said, these two teams met just a year ago, and that game was special to one of Notre Dame's top defenders. Megan, fighting Irish linebacker Jeremiah Wusu koromoa made his first career start against the Cardinals, and he's exploded onto the scene ever since. JOK is already receiving first-round buzz for the upcoming 2021 NFL Draft. Owusu Koromoa also provides a buzz for the crowd. In his last game against Florida State, Owusu Koromoa delivered some big blows that got the 10,000 fans inside Notre Dame Stadium to ooh and ah. JOK says he loves the energy that comes with those big hits. When you make a big hit, you know, you you, you, know, you don't want to celebrate right away. You want to make sure your body your body's fine in itself. But, you know, the energy automatically flows, um, you know, when things like that happen, you hear the audience, you see your teammates running over, you want to celebrate with them. And, you know, it's all fun and games at that point, but you always got to make sure that you reset um, because the next play is coming up. And the next team coming up for JOK is Louisville, a team that the linebacker recorded a career high nine tackles against in 2019. Now, Lindsay, last year's Louisville game was the first start for Jeremiah Wusu koromoa but it was also the first college game for another star on that Notre Dame defense. You're exactly right. This was actually Kyle Hamilton's first taste of college football when they faced Louisville. And the very next week, and the first half of his very first game inside Notre Dame Stadium, the true freshman safety had a pick six. He sent the crowd wild. I can still remember being on the field for this moment, and it gave me goosebumps just thinking about it right now, or maybe it's this Michiana win. But either way, this kid has been a star, and he's continued to be a standout for the Fighting Iris defense. Head coach Brian Kelly has praised the sophomore's performance performance and leadership on the field. But the young star says he's not paying much attention to all the hype. He's just focused on playing ball. In terms of people saying like I'm a star or whatever, I think uh, that's good and all, but I try not to get caught up in that. I try not to look too much in them social media and stuff like that. Just try to be myself and keep down the path that I'm going because the distractions do anything, do all they do is just slow me down. So I feel like if I just stay to myself and follow my orders and do my job, I feel like I'll be successful. Hamilton injured his ankle in the first game of the season, but it didn't take long to recover. He was back on the field last week, continuing to make big plays for the Fighting Irish defense. Mark and Chuck, I'll send it back to you in the stadium. Well, the one thing you know about Hamilton, he's not throwing away his shot. Up next, class is in session on the countdown. Professor McGraw tells us about her new teaching career. Plus, we asked Muffet about her likely future statue on campus. And here is another countdown trivia test. 50 years ago today, Notre Dame played Missouri. What is that game now best remembered for? The answer when the countdown returns in two minutes. Here is your Countdown to Kickoff trivia answer. 50 years ago today, Notre Dame visited Missouri in a game best remembered for featuring not one, but two men who would lead the Irish to a national championship. Dan Devine coached the Tigers against Era Parsegan's Irish that day in Columbia, and the man who authored those 1966 and 73 Notre Dame titles got the best of Devine's squad, winning 24-7. Of course, Devine would follow Era in the shadow of the Golden Dome just five years later, winning his own national title in 1977. Now we pick up our conversation with a woman who has two rings of her own, Muffet McGraw. And we start with the retired head coach's transition from the hardwood to the classroom. 
So now you are Professor McGraw, Notre Dame College of Business. You're teaching this course, uh, Sports Leadership, How Leaders Make Teams Flourish. How do you like being a professor? What do you hope the students get out of your class? Well, you know, we went around the room the first day and I asked them what they wanted to get out of class. And I said, you know, actually, I haven't finished my syllabus yet. So you might give me some good ideas of things to do. Um, you know, I just really wanted to learn how to be a great teammate first. And then as a captain of a team, how to be a leader and what it takes to speak up, what it means to be a leader. And just to look at things. We're doing everything in teams with our group projects. And what are you learning? Like, look. Keep an open mind. I think that's the most important thing to be open minded and know that everybody you meet has something to teach you. Now, when I always pictured my retirement, I thought I'd be on a beach somewhere and enjoying myself, but you've been super busy. Like you said, you're a professor, but you also helped out in the community with the food drives. I'm curious, how much food have you collected? What made you decide to start these food drives and how have you seen the community come together with your food drives? Well, we've gotten over 21,000 pounds. That was my goal was 20,000 pounds. And, you know, I think when this whole thing started, you watched the news and all you saw were the lines at the food banks across the country. And like everybody else in the community, I wanted to do something to contribute. So I started with the food drives, just stuffing mailboxes, doing my neighborhood and then branched out and a lot of people helped me. And I was just overwhelmed with the generosity of this community. People were amazing. Everybody did so much. Um, to help me collect that. And then the Alumni Association jumped on and we had a national drive, Meals with Muffet, and we collected almost 150,000 pounds and about $90,000 to contribute to food banks locally across the country. Muffet, how about this pup talking about his retirement? What would he know about it? <laughs> He's not even earned his wings yet. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I want to know, uh, and, and you deflected this question, I believe, at your retirement press conference. But all these coaches who have won national championships in football have their statues. I picture the statue of you squatting down outside Purcell Pavilion with the heels on. Is that the pose that you want for your statue? Because there's got to be one. <laughs> that seems to be the one that people always talk about. That's the biggest question that I get. And uh, I should say that when I decided to retire, it's because I, I had trouble getting up from the squat. And I thought, you know what? It must be time to go. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, Coach, uh, big game for Notre Dame football on Saturday, playing Louisville. What's your score predictions for Saturday's game? You know, I've been so excited watching the Irish this year. They're really doing a great job. And it was fun to be at that first game just to see what it was going to be like. Wanted to go out and support the team. And uh, I think that Jack Swarbrick has done a phenomenal job of making this happen. Uh, excited for the team to be in a league. You know, it's funny seeing ACC on the field, isn't it? I said, we should take a picture. I don't know how much longer this is going to be there. Um, but I, I think we're going to do well. I think we're going to have another big game, um, another big offensive output like we did last time. So uh, I, I don't like to make predictions, but I think we'll win easily. I like the pose for her on the ground, but I also think her with the net in her hand in the air would be pretty good too. That wouldn't be a bad one either. Hey, coming up, it's a standout shiner that Irish fans will remember for a long time. Liam Eichenberg showed just how tough he is after that gruesome looking injury. The Irish tackle tells us how he got back on the field when the countdown returns back in two minutes. Back on the countdown where we all know football, it's a tough sport. Fans celebrate the rough hits and the crazy plays. And as we saw last week, sometimes it even means getting socked in the eye for the sake of a play. Let's bring in the countdown's Megan Smedley back in the studio and check in on Notre Dame's reigning tough guy. Mark and Chuck, I definitely need two eyes to read off the teleprompter, but apparently after watching Liam Eichenberg last week, you don't need both eyes to play football. Yeah, my teammates were, <laughs> they just kind of looked at everyone like, oh my God. Um, I really didn't realize how bad it was until I got in the locker room. I mean, I, I could still kind of see out of it. Um, I just didn't realize how small it was at the time. It was the shiner scene around the world. Irish left tackle Liam Eichenberg was jabbed in his left eye early in the second quarter against Florida State. At first, when I came out of the game, the biggest issue was I didn't have my contact in. So I was trying to get that thing in. It was just kind of tough because it was so swollen. And I ended up running back in the locker room trying to get it in. I mean, it took a full quarter to get in. Coming out of halftime, he was ready to go. My first thought was I need to go back in the game because, um, I mean, it's you got to you gotta take care of business no matter what. I, I can tell you a lot of guys have dealt with a lot of things um, in past seasons, and they were able to be out there. So I felt like it was no exception for me. 
Head coach Brian Kelly said once the trainers gave Eichenberg the okay, there was no doubt. Then I asked Liam, I said, Liam, how do you feel about playing? And he said, I feel great. I want to go back in there. So um, there wasn't any hesitation at all. As the game wore on, Eichenberg's eye continued to swell, looking like Rocky Balboa after a couple rounds. I could I could see for the majority of the time, but I guess like towards the end of drives, it was pretty swollen, so I had to come off and ice it. His teammates admire his grit. You you can tell that that had an effect on uh, other players in our in our program uh, about him, you know, being gritty and and fighting through to to get back out on that football field. He's just strong and he wants to be out there. He's tough and that's that's what Liam showed. He he got back out there when he could, when he could see. It was this shot that went viral, even earning Eichenberg some big respect from Barstool. I'm honored to receive a football guy of the week. Um, fish for grit. I appreciate it. But uh I mean I was just happy I could be out there and we could get the get the win, you know. Now, even with a wounded eye, Eichenberg hasn't lost his focus. A lot of technique needs to be cleaned up and a lot of fundamentals and you know assignments as well. So, I mean, there's always room to improve, but I think we're going in the right direction. We just need to keep going. Now we talked to Eichenberg on Tuesday and he said his eye was still a little sore, but was getting better by the day. Up next, Chuck and Mark are rejoined by Tim and Tim. They talk defense and what to expect from Louisville in the Irish Illustrated Report in two minutes on the countdown. Here are the final results of this week's Lock Monday Auto Group Irish fan poll on WNU.com. We asked with Notre Dame currently number four, will they still be in the top four at the end of the season and make the college football playoff? 56% of you told us yes, 44% said no. Thank you for voting in the Lock Monday Auto Group Irish fan poll on WNU.com. Last week, the Irish defense sure looked at times like an obstacle to those playoff dreams. And that's where we pick up our Irish Illustrated Report with Tim O'Malley and Tim Priester. Let's take a look, Tim O'Malley, at the Irish defense, because first Mike Elko and then Clark Lee built this defense up to be a strong point. But I thought last week the defensive ends and the linebackers really had bad games. Was that just an aberration, or is that a cause for concern on this team? You know, I didn't think the defensive tackles played all that well either. Um, I, I believe they did miss Myron Tugabailo-Mosa, and I think Jack Kaiser would have started a game number two at Buck linebacker, just his instincts and the way he flows to the ball will help. Um, now, they're back this week, but if you just start practicing Monday or Tuesday, that doesn't mean you're in good enough shape to play a very big role on Saturday. I do think you're going against a skill position group that could take advantage of Notre Dame's Buck linebackers and some players in space. But I have a lot of faith in Clark Lee, and I, I, I don't think it's lip service when Brian Kelly said, look, we, we were back practicing last week. <laughs> Those are guys coming out of quarantine and isolation and guys that hadn't practiced in weeks. I, I think you will see a much more cohesive defense this week. I don't count Clemson in any aberrations or trends, so more aberration than trend for the rest of the season. Well, TP, Louisville's got a 2-2 and a yaya, -ya, so there's something to look for there. But uh, what else should concern Irish fans about the Cardinals? They did see them last year. I think 2 is more of a concern than yaya. Yaya's on the defensive side of the ball. 2-2 Atwell, he can beat any secondary deep. Um, you know, as far as Louisville's defense, there are coverage busts waiting to happen. So I think most of the concerns, virtually all the concerns for Notre Dame, or with Louisville's offense, you've got a ton of playmakers there. They've turned the ball over 11 times. You can't expect that trend to continue. And Notre Dame's defense hasn't been turning the, the turning over offenses. With Atwell, their running back, Javian Hawkins, is dynamic. They have other receivers in Des Patrick, Justin Marshall. I really like uh, Braden Smith. And their tight end is good, too, Marsh, Marshawn Ford. All right, fellas, score prediction. Tim O'Malley, we'll start with you. Points. Notre Dame is going to score points. Louisville is going to score points at some point, uh, whether it's backdoor situations or not. But Notre Dame's offensive line will settle in and own this game. Um, Louisville's 3-4 front cannot handle that group. It's one of the best offensive lines in the country. We obviously have to see them play Pittsburgh and Clemson to say the best. But I'm in the 45-24 range. It would not surprise me if both teams score more than that. I have a lot of respect for Louisville's three or four, five offensive players. Just as a whole, this line is going to bludgeon. Louisville's front. All right, what about UTP? Well, I had the under last week. I was completely wrong there, uh, but I do see a lot of points <laughs> scored in this game, uh, particularly by Notre Dame. I agree with with O'Malley. I, I don't see how Louisville stops this offense. 
I, and I think I think Notre Dame's defense will be better and more cohesive this week. But Louisville has more weapons to deal with than, than Florida State. Florida State had a few. I have Notre Dame 48, Louisville 20. And you can subscribe to Irish Illustrated, the number one source for Notre Dame sports online. Just head to irishillustrated.com and click on join to find the best plan for you. Up next, it's our Irish keys to the game. X factors and score predictions. The four wins casino, what to watch for in two minutes on the countdown. The national anthem has just ended here at Notre Dame Studio. We are back in the countdown. Megan Reed joins us for the Four Winds Casino. What to watch for, and we start with our Irish keys to the game. Mark Skoll, Jr. You got to step up on defense today. The Notre Dame defense did not look the greatest against Florida State last week, but if they pick it up today, I think they could do some damage against this Louisville offense. Megan? I say the Irish got to keep their foot on the gas. It's the second week the offense has all been back together. They won't have much trouble with Louisville's defense. They got to just put, pound on the points. Chuck. There are 76 teams in college football that play Division I, and Louisville is 73rd in turnover margin. The Irish have to exploit that. They've got to win the turnover battle today. Keep them out. X Factors. I'm sticking with my theme of defense here. The best player on the Notre Dame defense last week, in my mind, was Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa. He had some big hits. I'm expecting him to set the tone for the Notre Dame defense today. Megan? Chuck wasn't too happy with me when I took his pick, but I'm going with Michael Mayer, the freshman tight end. Had his first career touchdown last week. Look for him to have some big catches, some big blocks, and maybe even grab a second. Chuck? Well, you were right. The tight end's going to start today, but sometimes it causes me to tremble to watch number 24, Tommy Tremble, catch footballs, make blocks, do all the things that an X-Factor should do. He'll be a star today. Prediction time, what do you have, Mark? Chuck, it's very windy here, but I smell something in the air. A 50 burger is coming. Notre Dame's going to win 52-24 to over Louisville today. Megan? Hopefully it's a better looking burger than the last time, but I don't think they're hitting 50. I got 49-28 Irish. Chuck? Yeah, your 50 burger's a little bit underdone because the Irish are going to win this one by a count of 49-21 to today. Should be a lot of points on the board here at the stadium, and it should be an exciting one for the NBC broadcast crew to call. So let's turn it over to Mike Tirico and Tony Dungy for NBC Sports coverage of the Irish and the Cardinals. We're right back after the game with highlights and reaction on 16 News Now. Until then, so long, everybody.